Thank you, Victor, for the kind introduction. Good morning. There's an old saying that behind a good Cambodian, there's a great Texan. <laughs> and that great Texan is my wife, Martha. And if you can give her a big round of applause, I can do anything I want today. Right here. We are here today to exchange ideas. The epigraph of my book, of my memoir, Golden Bones, is an inscription from the National Library of Cambodia. And it says, force ties for a time. Ideas bind forever. Ideas bind forever. I lost my father when I was nine years old. And my mother struggled to bring me up and send me to the Philips and Doe of Cambodia. I spent a lot of time reading about the outside world in libraries. I became a flight attendant. I flew all over Asia. I became a high school teacher. And then finally, I became an employee of CARE, which is a relief organization. On April 12, 1975, I was supposed to be airlifted out of Cambodia. But I decided to go to a meeting, trying to save the lives of some 3,000 stranded families. When I arrived at the US Embassy, I was told that I just missed the last helicopter by 30 minutes. On April 12, that was a day that changed my life. Five days later, the Khmer Rouge came to power and they turned Cambodia upside down. Suddenly became, Cambodia became a land of blood and tears. There were only two kinds of people, those who had died and those who would die. My mother told me since I was a child, no matter what happens, never give up hope. The Khmer Rouge began a systematic massacre of those who, whom they considered as enemies of their revolutions. The teachers, the students, the nurses, the doctors, the merchants, businessmen, government officials, military, and those who wore glasses, because wearing glasses were a sign of being educated. So I threw my... I threw my Earphone also. <laughs> so I gotta put it back. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So I threw away my glasses and I pretended to be deaf, dumb, and mute. I couldn't see anything, I couldn't hear anything, I couldn't speak of anything. My mother told me to run because my background, university, university graduate, uh, English and French speaker, working for an American organization, would make me a prime target. She gave me her wedding ring, a scarf, her scarf, and a bag of rice. And I picked up an old bicycle I rode for three weeks, going through the Camaro checkpoints, faking, making uh, false excuses and fake passes. And I was put in forced labor camps. The entire country became a forced labor camp. I worked 18 hours a day, and I was given only one meal a day to eat. At night, when I went to sleep, I never knew if I would be alive the following day. So I learned that if I cry for having lost a son, tears will keep me from seeing the moon. I learned that the night is the darkest for those who cannot wait. And I learned that the sun will rise soon enough for those who are patient. When I woke up in the morning, I realized that I was still alive in Cambodia. I said I would make it to Thailand and to freedom. On February the 13th, 1976, I jumped off a logging truck in northwest Cambodia. My shirt was caught in a piece of lumber. I was dragged for a few hundred yards, and then I was flung off. 
Then I began to walk, to crawl, to swim for three days without having anything to eat. I fell in a booby trap and I was severely wounded. When I got to Thailand, I was completely exhausted. I was jailed for illegal entry. From a jail, I wrote a letter to a friend of mine in Bangkok, and he came to bail me out. I was later transferred to a refugee camp. There were some 3,000 refugees living in that camp the size of a soccer field. It was hot, filthy, humid. Most of them suffered severe mental depression because they sat down all day feeling sorry about the past and worrying about the future. I said I would do something to help them out, so I organized English classes. It was a win-win situation because they were able to get some English before they would go to a, an English-speaking country as refugees. Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the United States, and the UK. At the same time, they were able to take their minds off the sorrows and the worries. On June 4th, 1936, I arrived in Connecticut with two dollars in my pocket, my mother's scarf, and an empty rice bag. I was sick, tired, and exhausted, but I was full of hope. I told myself that I must adopt in order to be adopted. In French, it sounds better. It's s'adapter et se faire adopter. So I learned how to adapt to America so that I would be adopted by America. My first job was picking apples. I ate a lot of apples, <laughs> enough to last for a lifetime. My second job was at an ice cream store. I had to learn how to cook hamburgers, scoop ice cream, uh, washing dishes, and so on and so forth. It was quite confusing because I was holding the lettuce, and the trainer said, hold the lettuce. It took me a while to understand that she didn't want me to put the lettuce on the hamburgers. <laughs> then I was at the cash register. I saw the dimes were smaller but worth more than the nickels. It's very confusing. I said, I, it's very difficult for me. Next stop, New York, New York. I stood at the street corner in Manhattan and I saw all these checker cabs coming down. Drivers wanted, so I called and they asked me to go and take a test. It's a bi-directions. How do you get from the Waldorf Astoria to Yankee Stadium? I had no idea where these places were, much less how to get from one to another. So I just checked the boxes. At the end, I brought the sheet back and the examiner looked at the boxes. He frowned. He looked at me from head to toe. He sighed and he said, you passed. So I continued to do everything that came my way to the best of my ability. I got a scholarship to go to Columbia and I finished it in 14 months. I worked on Wall Street and I did a few other things. In 1988, I volunteered for George H.W. Bush campaign. When he got, he got elected, he asked me to work for him at the White House. When I walked in to work at the White House on February the 13, 1989, it was exactly 13 years from the day I jumped off that truck in Northwest Cambodia. I learned that uh, no matter what happens, never give up hope. And hope for me, it's spelled H-O-P-E, but H stands for honesty, optimism, perseverance, and extraordinary. George H.W. Bush said on June 22nd, 1989, that any definition of a successful life must include serving others. And my, my, mother, my mother told me that happiness is something you cannot keep unless you give it away. So I learned how to care and to share. When Bush left, I went, to back, I went back to the private sector when George W. Bush got elected, he nominated me to be an ambassador to the UN. United Nations is a very interesting place because for us, United States, we have a triple responsibility. We co-founded the United Nations, we play host to the UN, 
New York is the world's largest diplomatic community, and we are the largest benefactor to the UN. So each time I walked in, my colleagues from 191 countries looked at me. Through me, they saw you. They saw America. They saw its promise. They saw its opportunity. They wanted to hear what I had to say. When I said on behalf of the president, the government, and the people of the United States, that was my proudest moment. In 2006, uh, we decided to move away from the East Coast. Martha was working in the World Bank, I was working in New York at the UN, and we decided to come back to Martha's home state, uh, the great state of Texas, and we found San Antonio, and she got me a laptop. <laughs> <laughs> it was a message, it's time for me to go to work. <laughs> for 30 years, each time I introduced myself, people always ask me, when are you going to write a book? I was reluctant, because I knew that I had to go through a lot of painful memories. My mother was killed, my sister, my brother, 15 of their children were all slaughtered by the Khmer Rouge. It would be very difficult for me to go that memory lane. But as I continued to travel around the country and around the world, the questions persisted. When are you going to write a book? So I decided to put pen to paper. Now we got golden bones. Golden bones are terms used by Cambodians to call somebody who is very blessed, very lucky. When you look at this book, you are tempted to ask the question, who, what, when, where, and why? Who is it? It's Sichan Si. What is he doing? He's praying. Where? It's Angkor Wat, the world's largest religious monument. And what was it? when was it taken? In March 1992, when I was at the White House. We decided to send a delegation to Cambodia to look at the preparation on the ground. The United Nations was going to deploy the world's largest peacekeeping operation, 22,000 personnel. And we played a leadership role in that process. After meeting with all the officials, I decided to go to my village, my father's village. The villagers knew that I had survived the killing fields, that I was now working for the President of the United States. They said, you're truly a person of golden bones. Hence the title. So this photo symbolizes everything that is important to me and to Martha. Faith, family, friends, and freedom. And the message of the book is my mother's message. No matter what happens, never give up hope. So I learned to uh, hope, to dream, because I've heard what Robert God said. It is difficult to say what is impossible. For the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. When Steve Jobs passed away, I read his speech to uh, Stanford. And I think the theme of that speech was love what you're doing. Mine is the same, have fun doing what you are doing. Because in America, the three most important English words for me are only in America. Some of you may think you got mail. <laughs> Others, or I think most of us would say, I love you. But to me, it's only in America. It's only in America that somebody of my background could make it all the way from the killing fields to Connecticut, to New York, to Washington, D.C., back to New York, and then to the great city of San Antonio. So have fun, we'll travel. Thank you very much.